Uh, well, we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome back again, everyone, and welcome to any newcomers. We're on, uh, if my counting is correct, this is session four of our series on the Divine Liturgy. <clears throat> and uh, we started, or we left off um, at the third antiphon, the third antiphon. And we were about to begin the, um, uh, the small entrance. And so we're going to pick up there and just um, to kind of catch us up to speed. Um, let me see here. Oh, this is from last, the last one. Let me skip this. I meant to delete this. <clears throat> Okay. All right, so we said that, that we're going to approach this in two main parts. The first part, which we're still on, it's just we're going through and stopping where we need to in the first part. I've decided to call that entry, and that's going to take us all the way up to and probably through the great entrance. And then part two, which I'm calling communion, we'll look at everything that happens um, after the great entrance. So, allow me just to say one other thing. You might recall that I had mentioned that the antiphons are one of the more, let's say, unstable parts of the liturgy, that oh, history has seen a lot of different, a lot of fluidity with this part of the liturgy. And part of the reason for that is because this was kind of the popular part of the liturgy. It was the part of a liturgy that led literally led into the liturgy, led into the, the church, into the temple. And so it, it had a popular element to it, these simple chants that would be chanted back and forth. And what we're going to see both here at the beginning of the liturgy, where we are now, and then again at the end, when it comes time to look at the dismissal of the liturgy, we'll see that there again, there's some instability and fluidity but the closer we get to the core of the liturgy, which, we're, which we are doing now, the closer we get to that core, the more stable the liturgy is over time. In other words, there are fewer changes um, that are observed in this aspect of the liturgy in the core, which shouldn't be too much of a surprise to us. Um, you know, if we think of... Uh, if we think of the earth, right, we have the atmosphere that's covering the earth, and then there's the crust of the earth that has all the land features we're familiar with. But this is a, this is a, a turbulent place that, um, that is, um, the winds are blowing and the rains are falling. Like today we had thunder and lightning and all this kind of thing. But if you go under the ground, under earth, it's a lot quieter, it's a lot calmer. Now you're gonna get into, into science and tell me, well, Father, there's convection and there's the core and the this and the that, and there's gonna be eruptions, I know that. But the deeper you go into something, the core, it tends to be more protected, more um, secure, whereas what's on the fringes tends to be a little more malleable because that's what's encountering what we might call the world or daily life. Um, <clears throat> and we'll see this, like I said, again at the end, at the dismissal. So we left off at the third antiphon. And um, the third antiphon is what, what sort of bridges us into the small entrance. Now, if you look at your screen, it says here, the refrain of the third antiphon. And it says the appointed antiphon psalm verses and the apolitikion, which is the thematic hymn of the day, feast, and or season is chanted. So <clears throat> for those of us who are parishioners here at St. Nectarios, I want you to think to a typical Sunday liturgy. And the, at the, at, after the first two ante antiphons, um, through the prayers of the Theotokos, and then save us, O Son of God, the next antiphon, you hear the choir intone a psalm verse, and then they sing the hymn of the day. And as they're singing that hymn, then you start to see some movement. Whereas the, the clergy have more or less been staying put, you will, see, you will start to see some movement. And 
um, this happens during the chanting of that refrain of that hymn. <clears throat> uh, and incidentally, uh, that hymn really could or should be chanted multiple times, not just once. Uh, if we were to do it in its fullness, and uh, we could do that, we may start doing that. You may see that start to happen uh, in our liturgy. Um, but uh, just FYI, that's, that's actually something that's done multiple times, not, not simply once. Um, but I'm including here now the prayer for the small entrance. As I said, the, the third antiphon overlaps with this aspect of the entrance here. So the priest inside, still inside the altar, or if he has this committed to memory after the clergy have come out onto the solea, that space in front of the um, icon screen, the priest says this voice in a low prayer. He says, Master, Lord, our God, who has established the orders and hosts of angels and archangels in heaven to minister to your glory, grant that the holy angels may enter with us, that together we may celebrate and glorify your goodness. For to you belong all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. So I want to draw your attention to this prayer because as you'll, you'll recall from our, especially our first two sessions, I kind of, I kind of was trying to drive home the point that what we are doing in the liturgy is we are linking into the heavenly liturgy. We're linking into that liturgy that is ongoing, that is eternal. And we're, we're sort of plugging into that. Now, you will notice that this antiphon or this, this uh, prayer, rather, um, comes a little bit late in the liturgy, right? It's, it's already had a few prayers before it, three antiphon prayers. Three antiphons have been chanted. <clears throat> a, a litany has been uh, offered. And now finally, when we get to the small entrance, now we hear prayer, we hear language in the prayer about angels and us joining together with them. And the reason that we're hearing this now, you'll remember that I said last time, what we have is the beginning of the liturgy today was not originally the beginning of the liturgy. This was the beginning of the liturgy, entering into the church. And so now you see where we are asking, we are acknowledging that there is this heavenly reality, the heavenly liturgy, and we are asking God that the angels now join us and we join together to celebrate and glorify his goodness. So this is really where that starts. That's where this, we start to acknowledge and start to um, participate in this angelic reality that's happening. So as I said, this is the entry of the people with the bishop or the priest into the temple originally. And the gospel book, that, that big, beautiful, golden, metal-covered book that we carry is a type or a symbol of Christ, who is himself the Word of God, right? This is something we have to remind our, um, our, our fellow Christians who, who put, in some sense, rightly an emphasis on the Holy Scriptures, but then cast away everything else. We have to remind them the Word of God isn't a book. The Word of God is a person. The word of God is Jesus Christ, and not everything about him is in those pages. It's there. It's so that we will have faith, as the, as, um, the evangelist John tells us. He says, if everything about Christ were included, there weren't, wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain everything. But these things have been written so that you may have faith. So that's the point of the book, the gospel. But it is a type or a symbol of Christ, who is himself the word. Now, St. Germanos, or Germanus, I don't know how that would be anglicized. Um, St. Germanos uh, of Constantinople from the 8th century, uh, he, he comments about this entrance. And he says, the entrance of the gospel signifies the coming of the Son of God and his entrance into this world. As the Apostle Paul says, 
when he, that is God the Father, quote, brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Okay, so we're seeing this connection of, uh, of what we're seeing with our eyes, what our worldly senses are able to perceive, and this connection with what is happening in the heavenly realm. That when, uh, when, when he brings the firstborn into the world, let all the angels worship with him. And we, of course, have asked these angels to what? Now also worship with us or for us to be able to worship with them. <clears throat> As the clergy come out of the altar table bringing the gospel and stand in front of the icon screen in front of the beautiful gate there, the priest quietly says, he, he takes his hand and he blesses that entrance, the, that gate, that portal. And he says, blessed is the entrance of your saints, always, now, and forever, and to the ages of ages. Now, saints here, the word uh, I ye um, holy ones, this is referring to us, okay? This is who we are. This is who we are supposed to be. We'll, we'll look later in the liturgy where when it's time um, for Holy Communion, the priest lifts up the consecrated bread and says, da aia dis aies, the holy things for the holy people of God, the saints of God, that means us, the faithful, the, uh, the members of the body of Christ. So this, uh, this, again, this harkens back to the original entrance of the liturgy of everyone coming into the church and the blessing of that entrance. And the priest or the bishop would say, blessed is the entrance of your saints, of your believers as they come into the church. Now it's been transferred to this, this entrance that takes place on the solea, that platform, that's slightly elevated where we walk, then the clergy walk into the altar, uh, which we'll, we'll take a look at um, hopefully next session. And so what is, the, what is the deacon or the priest carrying when, when he walks into the altar? He's carrying the gospel book, which we said, of course, is an image of Christ. And so it is literally Christ who is leading us in. We are entering with him. Uh, think of uh, if you've ever been to an Orthodox wedding, when, you know, this sort of joyous and most dramatic part of the wedding takes place, the, the, the priest grabs the hands of the bride and the groom in his, in his left hand, and in the right hand, he's cradling the Holy Gospel, which of course is Christ, it's the image of Christ, and he then proceeds to lead them in their first steps as husband and wife, signifying that Christ is leading them, or should be, throughout their marriage. So it's the same way here. We, Christ is leading us into the worship. He is assuming his place as the high priest at the altar table. Okay, and we said uh, that this would have taken place first from outside the main door of the church, the so-called royal door, and then uh, the faithful would be led in by the bishop or priest. So I've, uh, I've brought up this, uh, this plan of the temple again to refresh our memory. Okay, and if you look at your screen, I don't actually have it labeled, but this, uh, well, you, where you see my cursor, this uh, center thing here, we could consider the outer door. And in, uh, in some older churches, there would have been an entire courtyard built around the entry of the church where the faithful would have waited and gathered, waiting for the bishop or the clergy to come to lead them in. And then they would come in through this back door and then through the royal door down the center aisle into the into the church and fill the church to begin the liturgy we kind of see a remnant of this uh sometimes it's not done everywhere but in some uh some places at pascha the faithful exit the church entirely they empty the church and then what they re-enter together right so um we still can we still see some movements like that there are traditions out there that maintain this to a degree now, I want to show you, uh, in case you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, this is just a very simple animation to show you what it is that I'm talking about. And this, this is assuming that you have a deacon and a priest. So D is the deacon, P is the priest. And this is the altar table. Here's the icon screen. Here's the beautiful gate. Here's the solea. Okay. And when 
when the deacon, if there is a deacon or the priest, picks up the gospel table off the altar, well, then they then they proceed out of out of the altar through the gate, uh, the north gate, which is up here, onto the solea. So you usually are seeing everything that happens out here. Okay, so this kind of gives you an aerial view of what that motion looks like. That there's this procession around the table with the gospel out onto the solea, into in front of the the beautiful gate, and here is where the priest says, uh, blessed is the entrance of your saints. Um, and then as we start chanting the chant that comes afterwards, the deacon proceeds in to place the gospel book on back on the altar table. And then the priest enters in as well to resume his place uh, for what comes next in the liturgy. So when the clergy come out, and stand in front of the gate, the deacon, if there is one, or the priest, if there is not a deacon, will say, Sophia, or thi, wisdom, stand upright, or pay attention, or arise. There are different ways that this word, or thi, this command, is uh, translated, but it means orthos, means orthos means straight, right? In other words, stand up, pay attention, snap out of it, <laughs> wake up, um, okay? And then immediately, immediately we start chanting what? Come let us worship and bow down before Christ, right? So there's, there's this uh, idea that pay attention, stand up straight, because now we are going to bow down. You can't bow down if you're already down. You can't bow if you're already sitting. So this calls us to attention and then invites us to come and worship and bow down before Christ. And that's the point at which the clergy then process into the uh, altar through the beautiful gate. As I said, the deacon or the priest places the gospel on the holy table. And then um, the hymns after the entrance are chanted, right? So the clergy, if there are multiple clergy serving, they will chant usually the first hymn in the series and then the last. Um, but so either the clergy and or the choir and or the people will chant the hymns of the day. Remember I talked about last time, uh, the, these apolitikia, these hymns, uh, are kind of like anthems and they're meant, they're, they're a popular element in a way. And they're meant to be learned and enjoyed and chanted um, with, with joy and energy by the faithful if they, if they so choose, if they're able, if they've learned these hymns. And uh, many of them uh, are relatively short they have um, melodies that we hear over and over again. They're based on hymns with the same melody. So they start to become ingrained over time for us. And I, I used last time, of course, the example of the hymns for St. Nectarios, right? When we, when we gather together for the liturgy and it's time for those hymns to be chanted, it's not everybody, but you start to hear numerous voices start to chant these hymns because everybody has become familiar with them and, and, even if you don't, you don't know every word, you still might sing along and drop out when you don't know that word. And it's, it's kind of a nice uh, communal moment uh, in the liturgy. Uh, and um, it can be very powerful as well. This is perhaps most um, noticeable after Pascha when we chant Christos Anesti, Christ is risen, uh, so beautifully and so powerfully together. Um, that really, that really sort of captures that popular kind of hymn to express our joy and gladness in what Christ has done for us. So these hymns are chanted, and then it's time for the Trisagion hymn. Okay, so we're going to spend a little bit of time now looking at the Trisagion hymn. <clears throat> it's, actually, it's actually an interesting hymn, has an interesting history. We won't go into all the history, but we'll, we'll take a look at it here. And uh, I, think, I think you'll find this interesting. Now, the Trisagion hymn dates to us from probably the fifth century. That's when it sort of came into being, came into use. And I'm gonna read to you this uh, narrative that I've included on the screen here. And this is according to St. John of Damascus, who uh, he, he died in the mid eighth century, uh, probably wrote this 
uh, a little while before that. Uh, and this comes from his extensive exposition on the Orthodox faith. And uh, he, he tells us the history of the Trisagio in him. So listen to this. He says, ecclesiastical historians, church historians, say that once when the people of Constantinople were offering prayers to God to avert a threatened calamity, in this case, it, it was an, uh, an earthquake that, that was uh, causing the distress. When Proclus was the archbishop, it happened that a boy was snatched up from among the people and was taught by angelic teachers the thrice holy hymn, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. And when once more he was restored to earth, he told what he had learned, and all the people sang the hymn, and so the threatened calamity was averted. And in the fourth holy and great ecumenical council in 451, the one at Chalcedon, we are told that it was in this form that the hymn was sung, for the minutes of this holy assembly so record it. So this is fascinating because it, it, it tells us a few things. First of all, it tells us that before the fifth century, this hymn was not part of the liturgy. And it tells us that it has this sort of strange and divine origin. And um, the, the Trisagion hymn, as we'll see shortly, is one of actually, I would say, three Trisagia hymns. Now, the word Trisagion means, it's, it's a compound word, tris, which means three or thrice, three times, and then agios, which means holy, thrice holy, three times holy or triple holy. And this is a reference, actually, to what Isaiah saw in his vision. And we use that trisagion also in the liturgy, don't we? Agios, 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 kyrios, sabaoth, right? Holy, 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 Lord of hosts or Lord sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory, right? We have this hymn later in the liturgy, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this again later. This is, that's really the original trisagion hymn. And we'll see where St. John Chrysostom comments about its use in the liturgy. And then there's another kind of version of that in uh, John's book of Revelation, where there's another triple um, a thrice holiness, let's say, of the divinity that is proclaimed. We'll see them. I've, I've got the quotes uh, to show you later. So these were the ones that would have been used because they were scriptural. They were found in the scriptures. But this one eventually entered into the life of the church. On one hand, because of this, uh, this legend, and I mean that in the academic sense, a story that tells the origin of something, not necessarily, I don't mean that it's fake. I just mean that this is the, the pious legend of this uh, hymn coming into being. So on one hand, it's associated with a miracle and with the um, alleviation of a threat to the people. On, another, on the other hand, it also aligns theologically with what has already been revealed to the church at this point. And this was taken to be an emphasis, it gave emphasis to the, the nature of God as Holy Trinity. In the sixth century, there was a version of the hymn circulating that added uh, Lord Jesus Christ who were crucified for us, or just said who were crucified for us. So holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, who were crucified for us. And this was declared blasphemy and heresy. And this was the cause actually in the sixth century of actual riots because of what was included in that version of the hymn. And this version of the hymn actually is still sung by some uh, of the Oriental Orthodox. Uh, so it's one of those signs uh, that, that keeps us, that reminds us that we're not in communion with them. But uh, so it was argued that that addition to this Trisagion hymn 
was actually heresy because uh, it was referring to the person of Christ, whereas this was seen as referring to the Holy Trinity. And we'll see shortly what I mean by that. So I don't want to get too much too far into the weeds with all of this, but I, I thought you would find this interesting to, to see where this actually comes from. Um, and this is the prayer um, that accompanies the three Sagyon hymn. We actually have a prayer that we have to read before we chant the three Sagyon hymn, okay? Which may sound strange to us. Like, why do we have to ask God's permission to sing a hymn? But again, we'll see because of this connection with the angelic that it's a great honor for us to be able to do this. And the, the hymn, the prayer goes like this. And this is usually said inaudibly, right? So you are not hearing this prayer. So here's a chance for us to look at it and study. And it says, O holy God, who rests among the holy ones, praised by the seraphim, okay, which is a type of angel, with the thrice holy voice, right? Holy, 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 right? Glorified by the cherubim, another type of angel, and worshiped by every celestial power, all kind, every, every heavenly being. You have brought all things into being out of nothing. You have created man according to your image and likeness and adorned him with all the gifts of your grace. You give wisdom and understanding to the one who asks, and you do not overlook the sinner, but have set repentance as the way of salvation. You have granted us, okay, and again, the us here is referring here chiefly to the clergy. It could be extended to the whole congregation. You have granted us, your humble and unworthy servants, to stand even at this hour, this time, at this moment, before the glory of your holy altar of sacrifice, and to offer to you due worship and praise. And so, Master, accept the Trisagion hymn also from the lips of us sinners and visit us in your goodness. Okay, so this is why we say this prayer. This is the angelic prayer. This belongs to the angels. And, and yet we are taking it upon ourselves, or we are taking it as our own, so to speak, and using our sinful lips, right? St. John, St. James uh, in his epistle talks about how with the same mouth, out of the same mouth, comes cursing and blessing, right? We curse everyone, and then we ask God to bless us, or then we bless God, right? And we, 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 have, this, we have this sinfulness about us. So this prayer is even to allow God, to ask God to accept this, this prayer of the angels from us sinners. And the text of the Trisagion hymn is this, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. And I've included here just a few rubrical notes. Uh, when the hymn is begun, when the choir start to chant the Trisagion hymn, the clergy say it quietly inside. Okay? And uh, if there is one priest who is presiding over the liturgy, the hymn is chanted three times. Okay, the choir is chanted back and forth three times. If there is more than one priest serving, or if a bishop is serving, it is chanted five times. And the clergy join in the chanting of the liturgy. This is what happens on a Sunday here, because usually it's, Father, it's myself and Father Nicarios who are chanting. And so it ends up being chanted five times. And then it's repeated one more time. This is the vinamis, the command vinamis. Uh, so it's done once more more emphatically or with uh, more elaborately or louder or slower, some way to give more emphasis to it. Um, and once it's being chanted again, that vinamis with, the, with uh, more emphasis, the clergy um, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we make our way from the altar table to the very far end of the altar, where that high throne is or should be. And we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then say, blessed are you upon the throne of the glory of your kingdom, enthroned upon the cherubim, the angels, always now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. So again, trying to emphasize and highlight and bring to our attention, or rather bring our attention to the fact 
that we are engaged in something angelic. We are engaged with something holy. And this is something that should humble us. It is something that should um, place us in a state of reverence, in a state of um, awe, really. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons that the settings for the Trisagio and him on one hand can be sort of simple, right? Because they're these antiphons. It would have been chanted as the people were entering the church, but they're also powerful. They're solemn, they're stirring, especially when done um, with attention and especially with large choirs chanting them. So here are those other biblical references to a thrice holy hymn that has angelic origin and that was uh, seen in a heavenly vision. The first is, as I said, from Isaiah 6, holy, 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 Lord Sabaoth, all the earth is filled with his glory, right? We modify it slightly in the liturgy. And then, um, uh, then from Revelation, the ch fourth chapter of Revelation, uh, the evangelist John records this from his vision of the angels chanting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is coming. Okay, and this is a, this is a beautiful um, quote. It comes from a, a paper that I have included in the resource sheet you should have received a link to. If you didn't receive those, that link to that resource, please send me an email and uh, I'll, be, I'll be sure to send it to you. Let me um, pause here for a second to uh, put my email address in the chat for those who don't have it. Okay, so this, uh, this is from St. John Chrysostom actually commenting on uh, Isaiah 6 in this thrice holy hymn that the angels are singing. And he says, when was the earth filled with his glory, with God's glory? When this hymn was brought down to earth and human beings below became companions in the dance with the powers above, striking up a single melody and comprising or in composing a common praise. Isn't this such a beautiful and powerful image of, of our, our, our joining in this choir, in this dance with the angels who worship God constantly? Holy, 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 over and over and over again. By the way, that's, uh, that's eternity for us. So if you don't like the liturgy, I got news for you. So we're going to come back to St. John of Damascus from that same treatise that we read at the beginning of our look at the Trisagion on him. And he explains to us what the, what the hymn means, what it breaks down to. And he says, we hold the words, holy God, to refer to the Father, without limiting the title of divinity to him alone, but acknowledging also as God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the words, holy mighty, we ascribe to the Son without stripping the Father and the Holy Spirit of might, of strength. And the words holy immortal, we attribute to the Holy Spirit, without depriving the Father and the Son of immortality. So St. John of Damascus gives us a very concise explanation that the orthodox view of this hymn, that is angelic in origin, is a proclamation of the Holy Trinity. And, uh, and, and that the church associates um, that the holy God with the Father, holy mighty with the Son, and holy immortal with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and, and, you know, to this point, how, do, how does that hymn go? We chant it three times, and then what do we say? We say, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Holy immortal, have mercy on us. Vinamis, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Utterly Trinitarian, utterly angelic uh, hymn. Now, another note here is that this hymn, you may have noticed, is occasionally replaced. It's occasionally swapped out with other words. And in cases where that happens, we chant what is called the anti-trisagion. Anti in the sense of something that stands in place of, not something that's against. 
we're not we're not uh, we're not um, uh, protesting the trisagion. It means something that is taking the place of the trisagion. And on occasions where there were traditionally baptismal liturgies, like Pascha or Theophany, we don't chant Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. We chant as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Um, and on feasts where we commemorate the cross of Christ, we chant your cross do we worship, O Master, and we glorify your resurrection. Don stavron su proskinumen getina yen su anasta sin doxazumen. Um, so these, just for your information, there are times where you might be expecting to hear holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, and you'll hear one of these. And these are clues to us as to the meaning or the focus of that particular feast. Okay, so that's it for the Trisagion hymn. <clears throat> We're going to move now to the readings. <clears throat> to help us get some grounding in the practice of these readings, we're going to look way back to the second century, to the person of St. Justin, the philosopher and martyr. And in his apology, Apologia, his defense of the faith when put on trial, one of the things that he explains to his accusers is how the Christians worship. And we get this beautiful glimpse into what, what their worship looked like in the, seven, in the second century. And he says at this point, he says, we afterwards, whatever they were doing before, he says, we afterwards continually remind each other of these things, the things pertaining to salvation. And he says, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together. And for all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the maker of all through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. This is the second century. And on the day called Sunday, he's speaking in, uh, with reference to the Latin names, but it still would mean Kyriaki. All who live in the cities or in the country gather together to one place. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president, the person leading, verbally instructs, in other words, gives a sermon and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. This is, this is really a beautiful, beautiful glimpse into what the early church was doing. And it shows us what I was saying earlier, that this core of the liturgy has not changed. If you read just beyond this in, uh, in this chapter, he then goes on to describe uh, the Eucharist as well. And that core, that core of the liturgy is just unshaken. And this is what we've been doing since then and before. But let's go back to this line here where he says, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. Now, the memoirs of the apostles most likely means what we would call today the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or it could refer also to some of the letters of St. Paul. But one of the things that's very important to remember here is that they did not have a Gospel book like we have today. They had whatever manuscripts were available to them. They might have Mark's Gospel and a few of Paul's letters. They might have Luke and John's Gospels and one of Paul's letters and the letter of um, St. Peter. And, and it's interesting because it says that those things are read along with writings of the prophets from the Old Testament, as long as time permits. So it shows that there was just a, an emphasis on reading, gathering together, reading, um, proclaiming this good news to the faithful. And then of course it says after the reader has ceased, the president or the celebrant verbally instructs, gives a homily and exhortation, um, kind of helping the people understand. And of course, this is what happens today as well. Um, 
So this is, we're getting a, a glimpse at the primitive liturgy, the primitive synaxes, that gathering of the faithful Christians and what it looked like. And over time, of course, that developed and gained some structure. But again, the core is there. The church really wouldn't have a set canon of scripture for another two centuries. When it comes to the reading in today's liturgy, there are uh, two types of readings. We, we heard that uh, St. Justin was referring to the readings of the prophets, um, but this is, not, this is not included. I think we mentioned this uh, last week as well. that are read. One is from is the called the Apostolos or the Apostle, uh, the apostolic reading, uh, not to be confused with epistle. Epistle just means letter. Apostolos means the Apostle or the apostolic reading. And then there's the Evangelion, which is the gospel, the good news. And here's a here's a brief sketch of the order of these readings. There's the prokimenon, we'll talk about that shortly, the prokimenon of the apostolic reading. Okay, it's a, it's a, 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 a psalmic text, a text from the psalms to introduce the reading. Then the reading itself. Then the so-called alleluiarion, the chanting of the alleluia. And then the gospel reading. The prokimenon, which means something that is set before, okay, um, is the text prior to the reading and it's meant to be chanted okay and uh if you can if the, for those of you who have the the um the liturgy text up that i sent a link to uh let's see here in the chat if you follow that and if you scroll all the way to <clears throat> past the Trisagion to where it says the epistle. Okay, I'm just, I'm not going to ask if everybody's there. I'm just going to have to keep going. But if you find where it says the epistle, okay, you will see that the prokimenon is listed there in red, along with the mode, the musical mode in which the prokimenon is to be chanted. And then the psalm from which the verse is taken. Okay. Now you may say, well, maybe I've never heard this before. I, all I ever hear is that I, I'm looking at the text from this coming Sunday and the deacon will say, let us be attentive. And then the reader might come out and, and do something like uh, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. Oh, clap you hand, your hands, all you nations, shout to God with the voice of rejoicing, right? Wisdom, the reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, let us be attentive, and then the reading happens. But if you look at the text, where it says prokimenon, it tells you, it gives you more information. It says that this is in mode three, a musical mode, okay? This happens to be in the mode of the week. This coming Sunday is mode three, we're not going to get into all of that right now, what the modes are and everything. We might, we might touch on that at some point. But what, that, what I mean to point out is that this is, this is an indication that this is meant to be chanted. Okay? Um, and, and that's chanted. Um, pull my window back up here. Um, so the, as we said, the mode of the chant would be announced. Um, the, the chanter or what would say... Um, Prokimenon of the Apostle, third mode, and then um, announce whatever psalm it is, Psalm 46 or whatever it was. <clears throat> and then that Prokimenon verse and, and the refrain would be chanted back and forth. Now, we see this here at St. Nectarios with what comes after the reading, right? With the Alleluia, right? If you're, if you're a parishioner at St. Nectarios, you will be familiar with this. After the ap ap apostolic reading is read, the choirs chant the Alleluia, right? Well, the prokimenon is meant to be done the same way. And again, this is something you may see us do eventually. We may, we may, uh, we may um, return to this practice um, as it's intended to be.
And then the reading is announced. It's proclaimed. The reading source. The reading, let's say, is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Or if we look at this coming Sunday, it's, uh, it's from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Okay? So it gives us context. It lets us know that this is actually, this is an apostolic reading. Uh, I'm not just reading my own thoughts here, right? I'm reading something sanctioned by the church, and I'm telling you what it is, so you can go back and check later if you need to. Right? This is public. This is done to proclaim. And then the reading is intoned. And uh, traditionally or ideally, we would say that it's it's done from the middle of the solea, again, that, that raised platform, facing east, facing the altar, not facing the people, but facing the altar. Now, uh, this is done in different ways in different places. And we're going to see actually at the end of our slideshow today, um, uh, a piece of the structure of the church that would have maybe made this make more sense, uh, what I'm saying here. but. So the reading, the reading is in tone. And uh, just a note here about this whole act of reading. <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, I think, last week or the week before about how, you know, we have roles in the church and people are appointed to the roles in the church and appointed to roles in liturgy. And we all have sort of our role to play if we, if we use that <clears throat> imagery. Now, a reader... Okay, if, if somebody comes up to the solea and has a book and they're going to read and somebody says to you, well, what's that person doing? And you say, well, they're reading. And what would you call that person? Uh, a reader, I guess, right? That's fine. It's an objective functional definition of what that person is and what they're doing. But a reader is actually uh, an order in the church. A reader is someone who is uh, trained and tonsured by a bishop to do what it is that they do. And they wear the exorason or uh, the anderia, a robe in the service. And they're also subject to canons, the canons of the church. And probably most importantly to point out is that a reader is actually one of the, what's called one of the minor clergy. There are readers and subdeacons and cantors, chanters, who are tonsured, okay, they, and they have their, the bishop's hand is placed on them, and a prayer is said. It's a distinction between ordination. So what happens to a reader, for example, is not what happens to a, a deacon or a priest to make them a deacon or a priest. But it's still, a, it's given by the blessing of the bishop. Um, and so this is, this is ideally, now I'm speaking in terms of ideal, this is the person or the these are the people who would conduct the, uh, the readings in the service, uh, whether we're talking about the apostolic reading, the reading of Psalms, um, the reading from the Synaxarion of the day, the list of the saints, etc. But I just wanted to point this out and put this out there so that you're aware that, that this isn't just, um, it's not a free-for-all in the church. We have roles that, um, that people are appointed to. We don't just, we don't just, have anybody do whatever it is that they're going to do. Um, and, and you just may not be aware that reader is one of those stations in, in the church. Um, uh, so we'll keep going here. Now, after, after that reading is done, and by the way, let me say here, uh, the reading can just be read, right, uh, as plain text. But the tradition of the church is that it is in tone in a melodious way, not to the point, it shouldn't be to the point where the melody obscures the meaning, where it, it detracts from the solemnity of the text itself, but it should be done in a, a melodious and beautiful way. Um, there's, a, there's a style that has developed in the church um, in which we do this, and it elevates, we might say that it elevates that speech, it elevates that reading that text from just being, say, like the newspaper to being something uh, of a higher standing, right? So this is the reason in part that it is in tone. The other practical reason is that an intoned reading is slower. And if it's done properly, uh, then it, it allows time both for the sound to travel, but then also for uh, the words to sort of sink in and for some emphasis to be given on the text itself. After this reading is done, 
the priest says, peace be with you, the one to the one who has done the reading. And then the choirs chant that Alleluia that I mentioned earlier. They start chanting that Alleluia. Uh, I included here the, what that word means, Alleluia, by the way. God be praised. It's one of those Hebrew words that was never translated from Hebrew into Greek. It was just transliterated um, because it made more sense to do that. You see this a lot, actually. Uh, an example of this in the, um, in the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, they won't use Latin sometimes when they, when they say, Lord, have mercy. They'll use Greek, right? We'll hear them say, Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy, or Christe eleison, Christ, have mercy, right? That, they opted not necessarily to translate that from the Greek, but to transliterate the Greek. And it's the same here in the Greek, transliterating the Hebrew. Um, and then at this point, the gospel is, uh, has incense, um, offered over it, and the priest then says this prayer. And this, this prayer may be familiar to some of you. You may have heard it read out loud, or you may have read it yourself uh, prior to a Bible study. Uh, Shine in our hearts, O Master, who loves mankind, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the proclamations of your Gospels. Okay, so we're asking God, to um, allow us to pay attention, allow our mind to be open to what is being um, read, what is being proclaimed, so that we can grow in our faith, we can grow in our practice of our, our Orthodox faith. Um, and so as it says, so that we can think and do all the things that are pleasing to God. Okay, and then I've briefly included here the, uh, the order. Um, Prokimen on there is an error. That should not be on the, in the chart there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this should be familiar to you. We hear wisdom arise. Let us hear the Holy Gospel. Uh, peace be with you all, right? The priest pronounces peace. The reading is announced. The reading is from the Holy Gospel according to so-and-so. Let us be attentive. And then the choir chants, glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. And then the reading is proclaimed. Just, and just like the um, epistle reading, it is intoned. <clears throat> uh, and then the choir again at the end, glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. The priest blesses the congregation with the gospel book and then comes back into the Holy of Holies to place the book back on the holy table. I want to say a word here uh, about language. Uh, in, different, in different parishes, you know, different languages are used. And, and our parish being of the Greek Archdiocese, the Greek metropolis of Atlanta, <clears throat> obviously we are a, a parish of the Greek tradition. And um, the use of the Greek language liturgically, of course, is something that has to be sort of gauged and judged. How much do we use Greek in, in a given parish? Uh, depending on the makeup of the congregation, et cetera. But one of the, one of the things that is unique to the Greek language and the Greek churches <clears throat> um, is that it's not, it's not just that Greek is, let's say, the, the inherited language of our forebears, for those of us who come from a Greek lineage. <clears throat> but in a much broader and deeper sense, <clears throat> Greek is the language of the gospel. It's the language in which the, um, the proclamations of the ecumenical councils were proclaimed. It's the language in which the liturgies were originally written. And so the, the, the Greek language, of course, um, communicates our theology, it communicates the faith in a certain way. So when we use, when we use Greek in the liturgy, <clears throat> it's not so much that we are appealing, let's say, to an ethnic identity, that we're appealing to... Um, uh, sentimentality of loving to hear the Greek language for some of the, our people. It's not so much that as it is keeping alive this language that helped to spread the gospel throughout the world. So this is, this is one of the reasons that Greek is still used in the liturgy uh, to one extent or another. So here at St. Nectarios, of course, we have to make these decisions as well and figure out what the right balance is. But you will, you will probably find and see that on days where the gospel readings are, are shorter, 
we may, we may read it first in Greek and then in English. And this is a practical consideration where it, it's not taking a lot of time necessarily to do the, the reading, but it also, it gives, it gives the faithful a chance to hear the gospel in its original language, and perhaps even to connect some of the dots when they hear it again in English with some of the words that they've learned. So this is, this is just something I wanted to bring to your attention as a consideration. And one of the things that we as your clergy try to put into consideration, I don't just mean here at St. Nectarios, but in any parish, when it comes to the language that's used in the liturgy. So um, just a few thought, thoughts for, for um, just to offer up to you in consideration. If, you, if you've ever wondered, well, why are, why are they using Greek or why do we use Greek in the liturgy? Um, you know, and we, we try to maybe move it around sometimes, like sometimes we'll do one thing in Greek and then the next liturgy we might do something else in Greek. And just to kind of keep, keep it um, so we don't get stuck in a rut either with regard to what we're doing, because then you might go your whole life never hearing one particular part of the liturgy in English. Um, so these are just a few considerations that we, that we have. I wanted to give you a word about the lectionary of the gospel. And this is how the, 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 um, the gospel text is sort of divvied up for the year. This is a sort of a simplified version of, of how that's done. There are four periods for the gospel. <clears throat> the first is uh, John, the gospel of John. And the, the gospel lectionary starts at Pascha, right? So it starts at John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, right? So just like... In the, so in the liturgical lectionary, the, the first reading is, in the beginning was the word. And in the Old Testament, the first reading is, what, in the beginning, right? So it's this, it's this reinterpretation uh, or recapitulation of the creation, but now through the lens of Christ. So from Pascha until Pentecost Sunday, we read from the Gospel of John. Then we get into the gospel according to Matthew, which it says here is divided over 17 weeks, beginning with the Monday after Pentecost, the Monday of the Holy Spirit. Then the gospel according to Luke, which is then divided over another 19 weeks um, after uh, the elevation of the Holy Cross. Uh, um, and then finally is the gospel according to Mark, which is read during the Lenten period. Uh, except for the Sunday of Orthodoxy. So it's just a glimpse at, at what that lectionary or that order looks like. Now, I'm giving you here, take a minute to look at your uh, screen, uh, just to give you an idea. This is a gospel lectionary, an illuminated manuscript. Um, I didn't actually get what uh, century this is from, forgive me, but it's, it's old. Uh, and um, it's a Byzantine manuscript, and uh, I'm going to let you sort of let it sort of scroll up here so you can get a look at it. This is showing the evangelist Matthew, by the way, plying his art. And, um, and we see here, this is, this is how it would have been written. And this is a liturgical book. This is the book that would have sat on the altar table. Okay. And we have here in the Greek, uh, right here, it says, ek tu kata matheon, right? So, uh, according to Matthew, and then it starts with the first reading. We see this uh, capital letter here, which is very ornate. You see Christ sitting here uh, and someone listening at his feet. And then it has the text here that would have been proclaimed. So if you were a deacon or a priest or a bishop reading, you had to be able to read this text. And remember, this is before, way before the printing press and way before most people had a copy of the gospel in their private collection. So you would go to church to hear the gospel being read. You wouldn't just pull it up on your iPhone on a whim. Okay, and you can take a look here actually at this script. Um, you know, and, and this is Greek. This is normal Byzantine Greek manuscript here. So this isn't some kind of weird language. This is Greek. Uh, this first line here, this, this letter is an uh, epsilon, a capital epsilon, E, right? And this, so this line of text here says, Ipen, all right, Iota, P, Epsilon, uh, Ni, O. And then this Kappa Sigma here, KC, 
is an abbreviation for Kyrios. Ipen o Kyrios. Okay. And it says, Orate mi kataphronite. Okay, this is, this is the gospel reading where he says, don't despise the younger ones here. Okay, let's move on to, um, this here is just a, uh, a detail of a Byzantine gospel lectionary table. So uh, you see how it's done in gold leaf and it's very ornate. Uh, and then here in these tables, it tells you um, when they would have been read. And I, I chose this detail to show you, first of all, this is done in gold. Okay, and then this is, uh, so here you would have, this is a mi, a m, and then ro. So this would be Mark. Okay, the gospel according to Mark. And then this one here is Lucas. So this is Luke. And then this is Ioannis, John. Okay, and it gives you the table for when they would have been read using Byzantine numerals. Okay. Um, I was searching online, by the way, and aside here, uh, I was searching online for an image to, to use for, for our, uh, for this presentation. And, and this one came up uh, as one of the top hits. And uh, I, I looked at it and it was actually taken by a friend of mine who's a Byzantine uh, art historian. And uh, so I decided to use his image, even though it wasn't necessarily the best, but uh, that was kind of a fun find. It's always fun when you find something on Google that a friend of yours might have uh, published. So um, we'll move on here. This is another, this is just another look at another type of script in a manuscript. Again, Greek, uh, you have the capital Taf here or T. And this, this should sound familiar to us when we read the Greek here. It says, tokero ekino, at that time, right? So this is, this is a liturgical introductory phrase for a particular type of reading. So it's, it's, it's not in the text of the gospel itself. If you were to read a Bible manuscript, it would not say tokero ekino at that time. This is how the church divvies it up and says, and it's telling us at this time, Jesus, you know, in this, in this uh, case, tokero ekino ilthen o Iisus, Iisus is abbreviated here, is capernaum, Aftos ge imitir aftu, ke i adelfi aftu, ke i mathite aftu. So Jesus, at that time, Jesus came into Capernaum with his mother and with his brothers and with his disciples. And interestingly here, this is a later Byzantine text. And we know that because it has accent marks, but it also has these red marks. And these red markings are what are called ekphonetic notation. So these would have been marks to help the deacon or the priest who was reading it to know what to do musically when reading the text. I don't really know what they mean. I don't know if they've been studied um, and if anybody can decipher them, but they, they would have told him how to intone that, that section of the text. And uh, we're getting to the end of our hour here. So I, I thought, um, oh, here's, here's a, an example of a Byzantine gospel book cover. This is from the 11th century. And you can see it's, it's gold. It has precious stones inset, inlaid. And then the center is a carved ivory plate showing Christ crucified with uh, his mother, Mary, of course. And then on the side here, the evangelist, John, and who is holding the gospel book here. All right. And, and these are reminders. These icons are reminders to us. John was an eyewitness. He was there. And so was Mary. And we know that Jesus said, woman, behold your son, talking to John. And he said to John, behold your mother, referring to Mary. And it says, in the, and it says that from that time, John took Mary into his home. So she lived with him the rest of her days. So we know that when John writes his gospel to us, he's spent time with Panagia, with the Virgin Mary. He's heard from her about Christ. They reminisced about their experiences with him. They remembered being at the foot of the cross. They remember encountering him risen from the dead. These are eyewitnesses to the word. 
So I wanted to show you this as kind of a final piece here. What you're looking at here is the ombo or ambon. And what I'm referring to is this structure in the middle of this church that I'm circling with my cursor. And what it is, it's you see these steps that go up and there's a platform and then there are steps going down the back side of it. And at the top, there's this sort of stone tent. This is the ambon, ambon. And we're seeing it, this is very rare. This is probably one of the only existing Greek Orthodox churches that has the ambon in its original place. This is in, uh, some of you may have seen this in person. This is in Meteora in Greece. This is in one of the old uh, churches there in Greece that dates to the, um, I think the 10th or 11th century. And uh, if you look behind the ambon here, where my, again, where my um, cursor is, this is the beautiful gate. This is the icon screen. Okay, so you see that this is situated in front of that right in the middle of the church. Uh, essentially, this is the pulpit, okay? And it has stairs, so they could be ascended and descended during processions, but it could also be ascended for the proclamation of the readings, the apostolic reading, the gospel reading, some of the pieces that would be chanted during the liturgy. Uh, we'll move to a, the, a view from the other side. This is the same church. You can see it just a little more clearly. Okay. And again, you see back here the beautiful gate. So, you know, the idea is that the clergy would come out and do the entrance and come up, ascend these steps. And then go down and into the, into the um, beautiful gate. And then again, would be, this would be ascended for the proclamation of the reading. So this would have been elevated. It would have been above the people in most of the people in the church. It would have been in the center. So if, especially if the church had a dome, acoustically, it would have been able to flood the space. It would have been easier to hear. Remember, they didn't have microphones back then and speakers. And um, I'm including this as a reminder to us that um, the liturgy and the movements that are in the liturgy have in a sense, they have a symbolic meaning to them, but they also have, they are also remnants of practical motions that were made in the course of the liturgy. <clears throat> what we see here, this is an, from another illuminated manuscript. Uh, I believe this is depicting the uh, Ambon, the Ambo in Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And you see the patriarch ascending, he's standing atop the Ambona here. And he's holding actually the relic of the Holy Cross. So this would have been probably the feast of the elevation of the cross. And you see with him uh, probably deacons. This is probably a priest here. <clears throat> and um, he's, again, this is a procession. He's at the top of the ambon and holding up, in this case, the cross for everyone to see. And for, what did we say one of the hymns was that we chant? Don Stavron Suproski Numen, right? We venerate your cross. So this is what people would have been doing. They would have been bowing down to the cross that was being held up in the center of the church. <clears throat> you know, the Byzantine art, this old art may seem very simplistic to us, but we really can gain a lot of uh, information from them. For example, you look at the ambon here, you see the structure, and we saw that, of course, verified by that existing ambon that we saw that's still in that church in Meteora. And you see here the different types of stone. This is probably supposed to be marble here, right? <clears throat> um, but then in the background, what do you see? Columns in the church, right? And then you see gold. This is probably the gold mosaic on the walls of Hagia Sophia. You see this uh, curved space that is either one of the domes or the, um, the, uh, the choirs of Hagia Sophia. And then you see between the columns even What's here? Hanging these liturgical textiles to adorn the space and, and separate the space from the other space, adorned even with the, the, uh, the I don't know, this might be a sort of like a cross type uh, adornment. So I'm showing you this again to show you that um, 
our liturgy is basically the same, but there have been some changes over time. And these are things we could eventually see come back into our liturgy. There's a little bit of flux over time that happens. And then uh, I've, this is my final slide. Now, what you're looking at here, this is a recreation, a wire drawing recreation of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, the sort of quintessential imperial Orthodox Church that really shaped the liturgy that we have today. <clears throat> and what you're looking at here is the, this is, uh, we might pull this back when we talk about the altar, but this is the altar table here that I'm circling with my uh, cursor. And it's surrounded by this uh, and covered by this structure called the Kivorion, uh, Ciborium, or uh, is how I think it's transliterated. Um, so it's just a structure covering the, the altar. This amphitheater type structure here at the back of the altar is called the synthronon, where the clergy would have sat together. And the high seat, the Anno Cathedra, is where the patriarch would have sat. The bishop would have sat here. This uh, wall was the icon screen, the iconostasis which was probably open and it had icons either on the columns or between the columns and would have had, it would have been shrouded with a curtain. And then coming out is the ambon. You see the stairs going up and then back here and the platform is covered by this ring. These structures, by the way, on top of this ring were uh, candelabras that would have held oil lamps to illuminate uh, the space. And this is where the, the clergy would have ascended to read or to give sermons. Uh, alternatively, the sermon would have been given by the patriarch in the Anno Cathedra. Um, this is where choirs would have gathered to chant because this was um, more or less under the main dome of Hagia Sophia. And uh, this, this architecture archaeology, we might say, this liturgical archaeology, helps us to understand the movements that take place in the liturgy today. So um, just we've, we've gone through the, um, the third antiphon, the small entrance, the Trisagion hymn, the readings. We've taken a glimpse at some of uh, the earlier church architecture that would have had a role in, in these elements. And then the final thing that I'll mention here is the sermon. The sermon traditionally is given after the proclamation of the gospel, which makes sense, right? You've just heard the reading. So now let's talk about it. Let's explain it. Uh, and this is the traditional place for the, uh, the giving of the sermon or the homily. And part of the reason for this, um, as we'll see next time, this was, this was coming to the end of what would, we might call the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the word, the proclamation of the readings, the antiphonal hymns, <clears throat> the sermon or the homily, right? And it's at this point that we would have said prayers for catechumens, those who are learning the faith, and then they would be dismissed. In other words, the first part of the liturgy in a way is educational. You hear the gospel reading, you hear the apostolic reading, you hear the sermon, and then those who are learning the faith would be dismissed. And once they were dismissed, the liturgy then took a deeper turn. It turned into the mystery of the liturgy deeper. And that's what we'll be seeing later um, as, as we proceed onward. The, by the way, the, those prayers for the catechumens are still part of the liturgy. They're still in our liturg liturgy book, um, just in most places, they're admitted. And for, just for your information as parishioners here, um, it's our practice here to read those prayers. We just read them silently, um, usually while one of, the, one of the readings is going on. Because the, the fact is, we have catechumens in our midst. We have people who are learning about the faith, and we need to pray for them. We need to pray for their enlightenment and pray for their, you know, because they go through a lot. Many of you may be catechumens yourself or were at one point. They go through a lot of struggles. Some of them are leaving behind something they've known their whole life. Some of them 
uh, their family may not be on the same page about what they're going through. They themselves are questioning and having and doubting. They may they may encounter um, obstacles along their way. And and these prayers ask for God to help them, to help enlighten them, and to keep them strong in until the, the time is right for them to be joined to the church in baptism. Uh, that that was the ideal, but of then of course through uh, chrismation, if that if that's the proper way to receive them. So. Uh, just so you know, those prayers are being read. And again, just like some of the other things I mentioned before, we may see these um, come back in a more visible or audible way in the life of our liturgy, um, whether here at St. Nectarius or broadly speaking in the archdiocese. These are things that fluctuate over time. 